everybody and welcome to the Hoover Public Library's 13th annual flash fiction event and our first flash fiction back in person after a two year virtual experience during the pandemic. My name is Melanie Lawrence and I will be your host this lovely afternoon introducing our writers and the pieces that they will be sharing with us today. We ask that you please silence your cell phones during the event. We are recording and live streaming today and we'll upload the video from today's performances onto the library YouTube channel. Flash Fiction is sponsored by the Hoover Public Library and the Wright Club, which meets one Saturday morning every month. If you're unfamiliar with Wright Club, it is a group hosted by the Hoover Public Library and moderated by myself, where local writers can get together to share works in progress, get feedback and constructive criticism, and network with each other. If you'd like to learn more, you can call the Hoover Public Library Fiction Department, check out our website, or email hoover.writeclub at gmail.com to sign up for our newsletter. And that contact information should be in your programs. Um, let's see. I want to thank you all for being here today and supporting your local writers. Without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker today. So first up, we have Marina Resner. She is a recent transplant to Hoover, Alabama, an independent contemporary fiction author known for her Kingsbury Town Football Club romance series. Marina has been writing for five years and in October published her third book in the series, Cup Tide which she will be reading a selection from today. And this is about Penny Adams, a young woman from Indiana who has been hearing a voice in her head to tell her to go to London to dig for the final resting place of the legendary Celtic queen, Boudicca. Boudicca, who is also known as Boudicca, or Boudicca, um, almost succeeded in driving the Romans from Brit Britain in the first century AD and was one of the most powerful women in her day. The spot that Penny wants to dig up is on the property of Dylan Ree, a former Premier League professional soccer player who has fallen on hard times. He owns the derelict foundry in North London that is also home to an amateur soccer club, Iselton, that he coaches. Penny convinces Dylan to let her dig and together they find proof of Boudicca's burial. When they take their evidence to the British Museum, no one believes them and they are sent packing. It is the last day of her trip, and Penny knows she'll be returning to Indiana a failure with an uncertain future. She has little money left, is hungry and exhausted, and with nothing better to do, she stays to watch Iselton play a night game at the Foundry Grounds. And here is Marina. Thank you. We'll pick up at chapter 14. Penny didn't know much about soccer or football as they were calling it, but after 20 minutes, it was obvious Iselton was struggling. There were a lot of missed passes and wild kicks, and on one occasion, two teammates collided. Dylan stood, his expression grim, while the other coach yelled at the players, trying to whip up some enthusiasm. Hoxtonboro was only marginally better and finally pushed the ball close to the Iselton goal. There was a flurry of short passes, and the spectators in the stands craned their necks to see what was happening. It was only after the referee signaled a goal that the opposing team celebrated, followed by a smattering of applause from the stands. The teams lined up again, and Iselton managed to make progress upfield for several minutes until the referee's whistle blew for halftime. Both teams trudged off the pitch uh, into the player's tunnel, ignoring the taunts of the spectators who lined the rail. Penny followed the crowd into the clubhouse. It was warm inside, and she found a seat at a table far away from a front counter loaded with fragrant meat pies for sale. They must be delicious, she thought. People were devouring them. Taking the wallet out of her jacket pocket, she counted her money. There was a 10-pound note with a picture of Jane Austen, four pretty five-pound notes, and some large and small coins. In total, there was 39 pounds and some change, which was about $50. Her room was paid for until tomorrow, and she had an underground ticket to get back to the airport. The flight to Chicago would take eight hours and the bus ride to Evansville another 15, and then a four hour wait for the connecting bus to Princeton. Her sister Angie was going to pick her up Friday morning after she got off night shift. A dull ache started behind her eyes and Penny rubbed the bridge of her nose. It had never occurred to her that she would find Boudicca and that no one would believe her. The reality was stupefying. She had spent five years of her life solving one of the world's biggest mysteries and no one cared. Penny's fists curled and uncurled as the unreasonableness of the situation weighed on her. The pounding in her head grew worse and Penny squeezed her eyes shut. Got a pound for the snowball? A chipper voice asked. Penny opened her eyes and focused on the tall girl standing before her. 
She was wearing a green and gray tracksuit with crystal embroidered on it and couldn't have been any older than 16. Her long hair was pulled back in a high ponytail and she was grinning from ear to ear. What's a snowball? Penny asked. It's the club's lotto, the girl said, proffering a brightly painted bucket. At every match, you pay a pound and get a number. And if your number is called, you get a third of that day's pot. Then the club gets a third and the snowball gets a third. It started last November, so it's been growing bigger and bigger since then, like a snowball rolling down the hill. Get it? How big is it now? It's huge, over 7,000 pounds, give or take a few hundred. The final drawing's tonight, so everyone is tossing in wads of cash and the winner gets half the pot. What do you say? The girl's enthusiasm was infectious. How much? A quid. Penny pulled coins from her pocket and held them out. Which one is the quid? That one, but for five quid, you get six tickets. I'll just take the one, thanks. Righto, here's your ticket. You print your name on it and drop it in the big glass bowl by the bar, or I can put it in for you. Penny took the offered pen, printed her name on the ticket and handed it back to the girl. The drawing will be in here after the match. Good luck. Back on the pitch, Iselton managed to even the score in the second half, but Hoxton rallied and scored another goal to win two to one. The mood afterwards in the clubhouse was sour as supporters sat at tables, grousing amongst themselves about the game while they waited for the snowball draw. Dylan stood in a corner with the assistant coach, avoiding everyone. Penny took the same seat at the back and was joined by an older man who sat down across from her and took a long draught of his beer. It is quality rather than quantity that matters, he said, smacking his lips in appreciation. And I must say the quality of this pint of bitter is exceptional. Seneca, Penny replied, recognizing the quote. The man nodded approvingly and extended his hand, the stoic himself. I'm Len Case, and who might you be? Penny shook his offered hand, remembering him vaguely from Saturday night. His grip was cold, his gaze piercing. I'm Penny. And to what does Iselton owe the honor of your visit? Len asked, his smile keen. It didn't reach his eyes. Penny shifted in her seat, feeling her stomach tighten with no explanation. I'm a tourist from America. I thought I'd stop in and see a real British football match. Well, you came to the wrong place tonight, that's for sure, Len goffed. Although the lads do play better on occasion. You were at the game on Saturday as well. Penny nodded. He was perceptive. I get home tomorrow. Len Case glanced at Dylan standing in the corner. Fancy him? Without waiting for a denial, Len continued. He's a washed up Premier League footballer. Quit last year, no one knows why. His girlfriend, a lovely girl, left him. Now he's here running his dear departed father's club into the ground. Len Case took another sip of his beer and shook his head and sneered. He's got no idea what he's doing and he's going broke. Wealth is the slave of the wise and the master of the fool. The Seneca quote spilled out of Penny's mouth without thought, her tone cold. Len raised his eyebrows. It is at that. Why did Dylan quit? No one knows. He was with Kingsbury Town. They're the big Premier League club in these parts. Their stadium, Townsend Lane, is just down the road. Quite a local boy makes a good story. Then his father died and he came back here. When was this? Last spring. Didn't even see the season out with Kingsbury Town. Left them high and dry in their FA Cup run. They lost the semifinal to South Quay Road because they didn't have him. Pitiful. He had to shut the foundry down, but that was hardly his fault. His father had no head for business either. What did they make? Len shrugged and took a sip of his pint. Specialty castings for airplanes. Oh, aluminum alloys, A356, A357. Penny knows her question caused Len to flinch. You certainly know your aluminum castings, unusual in a young woman. Len's eyebrows pulled together and his icy gaze almost made her shiver. Not that unusual. There's a large automotive manufacturing plant in the town I'm from. My family works there. Len's grip on his glass tightened. I'm sure it's all automated. Charles refused to automate, had to do everything the old way. Not much call for that anymore, and what demand there is has gone to China. There's a man who wants to buy all of it and is willing to pay a very good sum, but our Dylan says no, he won't give it up. Penny's mouth went dry. What does this man want to do with the pitch and the foundry? It might have been a trick of the light, but Penny saw Len hesitate a fraction of a second before laughing. Huh, ask anyone here, he declared, sweeping his arm around the room in a grand gesture. Build 10-story flats, an enormous mall. Or, he grinned, how about run a new underground line? But I tell you, Len leaned closer and Penny realized she had never hated anyone so much in her life. It's all rubbish. Reno, he's the investor. He's a smart man. He'll buy Iselton and invest money in it. Bring in some quality players. 
This area will benefit enormously. Dylan is just being stupid and selfish. Penny didn't know how, but she was sure Len was lying. The foundry and stadium would be leveled and built up. The property was 15 acres, and what she'd already seen of London, there was a lot they could cram on that much land. They would do it fast and with big equipment, and Boudicca's resting place would be destroyed. It all made sense now. Anger boiled through Penny's veins, and it took everything she had to stay in her seat and control her breathing. Len continued his tirade against Dylan for several minutes, oblivious to her mounting rage. At the front of the room, a man clapped his hands. Time for the snowball drawing. The crowd grew quiet as the girls' team, dressed in identical green and gray tracksuits, marched in with a large fishbowl decorated with a festive snowman. Penny tried to figure out which girl had sold her the ticket, but it was almost impossible. Although they were many shapes, sizes, and nationalities, they all had fresh scrub faces, their hair pulled back in ponytails, and huge smiles. Tonight's snowball winner will be taking home half the pot, which is now 7,502 pounds. And to do the drawing, Iselton Football Club owner and manager, Dylan Ray. There was a smattering of weak applause as Dylan worked his way through the crowd to the front of the room. Penny watched as Dylan, without further ado, plunged his hand into the bowl. No, Dylan, do it proper, the girls admonished, like a snow globe. Dylan gave a half-hearted attempt at tossing hundreds of slips of paper around before withdrawing a single ticket from the bottom of the bowl. Everyone in the room sat at attention. And the winner is, he announced, and then paused, looking at the ticket. The color drained from his face, and his throat bobbled as he turned the ticket over, and then back, and then over again. The crowd began to murmur as seconds ticked by and no announcement came. Come on, Dylan, who won? Someone from the back shouted. The winner? Dylan began again before seeming unable to continue. Yeah, Dylan, the girls encouraged. Can't you read the name? They crowded around him, but Dylan jerked the ticket away. Penny rose to her feet, her chair clattering behind her, and walked through the crowd to the front of the room. She stopped before Dylan and handed him her ticket stub without looking at it. I won. Thank you, Marina. Up next, we have Skylar Randall. He is a published author of crime fiction novels. His first novel titled Jacqueline Willoughby was published in 2017, followed in 2019 by the prequel titled Raina. And his latest book, Francis Laurent, was released in 2021 and was named Audiobook Reviewer's Best Thriller in the Crime category for 2021. Skylar lives with his wife, Yvette, and their West Highland Terrier, Q. Today, he will be reading an excerpt from The Anamnesis of Dr. Samuel Moore, part of his series in progress, The Good Doctors. Dr. Samuel Moore is a mortician and a doctor, as well as a uniquely talented and creative assassin. In this passage, he prepares Mr. Cogswell to pay the ultimate price for his crimes. Cogswell opened his eyes, unsure of his surroundings, through his blurry vision. He could feel the cold air against his cheeks, so he knew he was outside. He remembered flashes of what happened, Virgil throwing him into the back of a car, Dr. Moore injecting him with some kind of drug. He saw a fading blue sky with tops of pine trees silhouetted against the setting sun. As he managed to lower his gaze, he felt more disoriented. His head was upright, but he was too close to the ground to be standing. There was dirt, weeds, bushes nearby, and tombstones that, that towered over him. He tried to move, but his hands were bound tightly behind his back. He licked his dry lips, tasted dirt, and coughed. Something was keeping him from escaping. Finally, as he regained his senses, he looked down and realized he was buried up to his chest in tightly packed dirt. What's going on here? Where am I? No one answered. He realized he was in his family graveyard where his parents and grandparents were buried. Help, he tried to yell, though his voice was rough and weak. Help. He struggled, but it was hopeless. Had he been left here to die? He heard a car approaching somewhere behind him. Help! He broke into a coughing fit as the car pulled up nearby. Finally, the doors opened and footsteps approached across dry leaves. 
Help, he tried again, desperate to draw their attention. Two figures approached, one in old blue jeans and the other in a finely tailored suit that he recognized immediately. Dr. Moore and his brutish helper, Virgil. Cogswell certainly filled with rage. Let me out of here. What have you done? Moore stood a dozen feet away and stared at him. Let me out of here, Cogswell demanded. Moore squatted down. Mr. Cogswell, do you believe there's a heaven? Are you insane? Have you made arrangements in the event of your death? Do you have any idea who you're dealing with? What family you're dealing with? Moore smiled, unconcerned. My brother is the mayor, Cogswell told him. You'll hang if you do anything to me. Moore stood up, lit a cigar, and took a nice leisurely puff. He blew smoke rings in the air. Would you like, me to, would you like to kill me, Mr. Cogswell? Like you killed Mr. and Mrs. Jackson? What the hell are you talking about, Cogswell shouted. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Moore flicked his cigar ashes on the ground. Do you read the Bible, Cogswell? That's none of your damn business. Moore was amused at Cogswell's in impertinence. Perhaps you can't read, or you're simply an asinine, so I'll help you out. In Deuteronomy 19.10, there's a passage reading, Do this so that innocent blood will not be shed in your land, which your Lord, which your Lord God has given you as your inheritance, so that you will not be guilty of bloodshed. Cogswell was baffled. Are you some kind of preacher? Get me the hell out of here. No, I'm not a preacher. I'm Dr. Samuel Moore, mortician, and owner of the Samuel Moore Funeral Home. He looked around the dilapidated uh, graveyard and turned to Virgil. Wouldn't you agree that this place requires maintenance? It's really quite a shame. Virgil strolled over to Moore. Yes, sir, it needs work, Virgil asked calmly. My brother will skin you both alive if you don't dig me out of here. Moore sighed. You're certainly not in a position to make demands. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a letter. If you'll indulge me, I have a letter from Mrs. Caroline Jackson Johnson, Charlie Jackson's sister. You remember Charlie? You killed him and his wife. Cogswell glared up at Moore. They tried to kill me. Spit flew from his mouth. My time is valuable, Cogswell, so let's make this short and to the point. You're going to hang, Cogswell grumbled. Moore opened the letter and read, Mr. Cogswell, my name is Caroline. I'm Charlie Jackson's sister. You murdered my brother and sister-in-law, Barbara, over a very small debt. You killed two parents in front of their children, and in doing so, you killed a little of the children's innocence as well. Perhaps you're used to getting your way with murder in your harbor little town, but no more. Dr. Moore has volunteered his services to correct your sin and make it right to place justice on the injustice of my brother and his wife's death, and perhaps teach you the final lesson of your life. May God have mercy on your soul. Dr. Moore folded the letter and placed it back in his jacket. I will say that was one of the most elegant letters I've read to those in your predicament. Are you going to kill me? Moore repeated, I hope your final arrangements are in order. You hang, Cogswell said. Before we continue, however, Moore told him, I'd like you to meet a special guest. Special guest? Cogswell asked wearily. Moore waved at someone behind Cogswell. The car door opened and another pair of footsteps approached, dragging something heavy through the dirt behind him. Cogswell heard the person stop just behind him, but he couldn't yet see who it was. Hello, Mr. Cogswell. The voice of the special guest was tight with restraint. The special guest walked around to the Cogswell line of sight. It was a boy, a young man of perhaps 17 or 18 years old. His eyes were solemn and dark as he dragged a baseball bat through the dirt as if taunting Cogswell. What is this? Cogswell demanded. Do you recognize him? Moore asked. Cogswell looked at the boy's face. I've never seen him before in my life. Oh, but you have, Cogswell, Moore informed him. This is Jimmy Jackson. You killed his parents while he watched. Cogswell whipped his gaze to Moore. They tried to kill me. That's a lie, Jimmy shouted. Moore remained calm. Jimmy asked to be here today. 
to contribute. Jimmy stepped forwards towards Coxwell. My father loved baseball. The Yankees, that's his, was his team. Not that you care about any part of them. Coxwell glared at Jimmy. He taught me everything he knew. Jimmy smiled. I really know how to swing a bat. You're a kid. What are you going to do? Coxwell strained against his earthly prison. As I said, Moore explained, Jimmy's contributing to the day's festivities the best way he knows how. He nodded at Jimmy and took a long puff of his cigar. He won't be doing the deed, of course, he explained. He wanted to make sure, to make sure that you suffer as my parents suffered, Jimmy interrupted. Cogswell looked at the bat, suddenly understanding. They, they, they tried to kill me, he insisted. Finally realizing his fate, Jimmy stepped back, pulled the bat over his shoulder in a practice batter stance and took a deep breath. No, Cogswell begged as he desperately struggled against the death sentence holding him in place. Don't do this. I really hope you've made the proper arrangements, Moore said again. Don't do this, Cogswell pleaded again. Moore nodded at Jimmy, encouraging him forward. Burn in hell, Mr. Cogswell. With defiance and vengeance ablaze in his eyes, Jimmy swung, aiming for a home run. Thank you. Thank you, Skylar. Up next, we have Marty Elder. Marty is a retired accountant and is working on two novels, a mystery with a hint of the supernatural and a historical World War II fiction novel based in part on the diaries his father kept during his time in the Merchant Marines. He's waiting for the day that he wakes up and decides enough is enough and can finally stop editing and put them out into the world. Today, he is reading from his first published work, a short story entitled Night Visitors that envisions a chance encounter between several well-known characters from myth and folklore. Gavin felt much relief that all had survived the passage, for violent storms had stirred an angry sea. Thankful also was he that his charge, the young princess, appeared no worse for wear. Once all had were safely ashore, the, the ship departed rather than stay the night in the, this desolate land, a land many believe inhabited by savages. Cavan told his soldiers to gather firewood and make camp by the shore. Hi, stay with the child, ordered Gavin, pointing to the young princess, and make it your purpose to set stones for a central fire pit as well as three others some distance apart. Hi, would have preferred to gather firewood. In fact, any task away from the prying eyes of the child the central fire was much needed to afford relief from the cold. The other three fires were, uh, were of equal, if not greater worth, for they were set to ward off evil. For it was held that creatures from the sea, toads and eels, were thought to crawl from the depths and take the form of winged beasts and dragons under the cover of night. Though the child was but, but 11 years of age and appeared frail, she proved her otherwise as she helped high for gather the stones. Standing almost five feet, Hyphel suspected she would become a tall woman when she came of age. Her reddish hair fell in curls about her shoulders, but it was her eyes that captured his attention, for they were large and bright, their color a deep green, reminding one of shamrocks at the first hint of spring. The firewood took the flame and all gathered around. Selwyn turned to Hyphel and said, the flames ease the sting of the cold. I pray the cold is all we must face before dawn, said Hyphel. Those standing nearby heard his words. The ones who believed in the new religion made the sign of the cross. Those who followed the old reached for the foot of the hair that hung about their necks. All would have taken solace had there been either a priest among them to offer prayers to the new god or a druid to cast the spell from old. Hyphel glanced around and saw the child crouched on the stone, shivering from the cold. Her eyes met his. Sylvan looked back to the child, then to Hyphel, and said, Her eyes follow you like a puppy follows its master or she'd have a tail. I doubt not she would wag it when our eyes meet. Hyphel spoke loud with intent for the child to hear, yet she took no note for something else called her attention. Selwyn then noticed the same. They returned, shouted Selwyn. All looked toward the inlet. Despite a light snow that had begun to fall, two torches held near the bow clearly illuminated the outline of a ship. Not our ship, too small, exclaimed Gavin. 
With his words, the sound of swords and the clatter of shields broke the still of the night. Lower your weapons, commanded Gavin, for he wanted to gauge the intentions of these night visitors. A band of men left the ship and approached Gavin's encampment. I am called Ivan, the leader said, and I seek refuge for the lad in our company, for I fear his life is at risk in his native land. Ivan then motioned to a young man standing behind him. Gavin, sensing he had, no, sensing he had nothing to fear from Ivan, said, you and your soldiers are welcome to join us. Ivan and his band came close to the light of the fire, and all could then see that Ivan was a warlord. His helmet was made of bronze with a figure of a walrus cast into his crown, and from his wide belt hung a magnificent sword. Who then is this lad, a son of a nobleman who wishes to send his son into exile for his protection, asked Gavin. His station is far from that, said Ivan. Many years ago, the king's soldiers killed a recluse thought to be stealing sheep. Yet evidence of such never existed. Grendel, his young son, witnessed the killing. When he came of age, he hunted down the king's soldiers and killed them one by one. The king had then hired an assassin to kill this Grendel. This assassin had no knowledge of the events I've described. He simply took the task to earn the king's silver. It was then that this Grendel learned that this Grendel also had a son. Ivan turned and pointed to the lad, and the king feared he would take revenge as had his father. It was the lad's mother, a recluse, who paid me to take this lad to a distant land where he could begin life anew. Ivan concluded by saying, the bard cite verse that make this Grendel out to be more than a man, a troll even, and the assassin a great hero. The wishes of the lad's mother and of mine, said Ivan, low in his voice, are that in time the tale of Grendel and the assassin will fall from memory. Ivan then ordered the, one of his men back to the ship to fetch a keg of ale for all to share. He then asked Gavin of the venture he and his soldiers were about. Gavin said, the child is the daughter of an Irish king who is sending her to Athlon in order to seal the truce between our two kingdoms. Gavin chose not to mention the rumor that the child might be the Ill illegitimate offspring of the king. Do you and your followers serve the king in Athlon? asked Ivan. In fact, we are in service to one of his youngest but most trusted chieftains, replied Gavin. Keith then broke into the conversation. He had fought many battles alongside Gavin, but combat had taken a heavy toll. Of late, he had begun to rely on the effect of ale to ease his torment. Despite the bitter cold, Keith shed his woolen cloak and stood shakily by the fire, then said in a loud voice, We are escorting the daughter of a king? Is that what we're about? Why, I thought we were emptying the king's bedpan. This child is just a pup, no different from all the other pups whelped by the good king. And like any good king, he has seen fit to rid his litter. Now that the queen has given birth to a daughter, he must accept as his own. With that said, he turned to the child and gave her a mock salute. It was then that Heifel glanced over at the child who sat quietly with her head bowed. Tears streamed from her eyes. As the hours grew late, Gavin assigned Heifel to stand first watch. Later that night, Ivan awoke from a fitful sleep and, and, and joined him by the fire. Is the chief and you serve a man of honor, asked Ivan. The question caught Heifel by surprise, but he answered in a most enthusiastic yes. Though he is only a few years older than I, he has earned the respect of all who have privilege of his company. In fact, someday he might even become king. His spirits seem of a man of whom legends are made, said Ivan. I have no doubt the lad could earn honor serving your chieftain. He has a strong back, but I've observed he may have an even stronger mind. I believe his future would be best served if he could learn to read and write. I had a tutor, a man of great learning, said Heifel. I believe he would take great interest in teaching this lad. Heifel didn't mention that his tutor had a propensity for silly tricks and sleight of hand, prompting some to refer to him as a magician. Ivan then said, if Gavin would have a mind to escort this lad back to your kingdom, I have sufficient funds to pay for the lad's education. He then reached into his cloak and produced a pouch that contained 90 pieces of silver. Heifel stared in disbelief. He often thought he would never meet a man of such honor as his chief in Athlon, but this night he felt before him stood such a man. Heifel had hopes of one day earning such honor, but the events of the past month weighed heavily upon him. Do you find fault with my offer, or does some other concern occupy your mind, said Ivan, noting Heifel's despair. I do not deserve to stand in the presence of an honorable man such as you. Are you sure you know the nature of the man to whom you speak, said Ivan? The question seemed directed toward himself. Heifel then broke down sobbing and spoke as a child would to, to his father. Saxons attacked a village near our own, and Gavin let me join the war band since I reached my 16th birthday. Before the battle, I felt stark fears I'd never felt before. 
I have no memory of the battle itself, but Gavin said I took the life of a Saxon who would have taken mine. With tears streaming from his eyes, Heifel looked up at Ivan and lamented, though I took a life, does the fear I felt beforehand mean I'm a man without honor? Ivan said, I see no dishonor in the fear you felt of the life you took. He continued, again speaking to, more to himself than to Heifel. A warrior heaps dishonor upon himself when he takes the life of someone who does not deserve to die. In a reflective voice, Heifel said, when I was a child, I had visions of becoming a great warrior and earning honor by ridding the land of outlaws and assassins. Ivan took a stick and poked the fire, sending glowing sparks into the night sky, then said in a low voice, you would not have to search far, young Heifel, for the assassin of whom I spoke now warms his hands by your fire. Heifel stared at him in disbelief. Neither spoke for a time. Deep in thought, Heifel, Heifel came up with a start. It is only the rigging in the ship that makes the winds cry, said Ivan. At first, Heifel thought it might be the baleful sound of the strange horn the savages play, a horn with many pipes that strikes many notes and lays one note on top of another. Ivan then said, I believe the lad would do well under your tutor. Heifel then asked, By what name is the lad given, for my tutor will have need to know. He is only known as the son of Grendel, but he can't start life anew with that name. Ivan thought for a moment. I have no son, I therefore shall let him carry my name. Then shall his name be Ivan, and known as the son of Ivan, asked Heifel. Ivan was the name of my father, not the name my father gave me. I have used my father's name on this journey to conceal a measure of fame I have neither sought nor deserved. Heifel found it of great interest that Ivan was not using his real name because neither was he. Heifel was the son of a king from across the southern sea who sent him to live and study in Avalon. Fearing Heifel's strange foreign name would be an embarrassment, his tutor changed it to Heifel. Ivan then arose by the fire and said in a commanding voice, Tell this tutor of yours the lad's name is Ivan, and that he is my son, the son of Beowulf. Ivan, then the warlord who now revealed his real name as Beowulf, took a deep breath and let it out into the cold night air, a breath that seemed to carry with it the anguish he had brought to the shores of this desolate land hours earlier. To change the subject, Heifel motioned the Beowulf sword and said, My chieftain has a magnificent sword such as this. He is named the Cardiff. The names Britons give are pleasing to the ear, replied Beowulf. Indeed they are, but not all agree, said Heifel. My chieftain's sword has drawn much Saxon blood, so they, so they gave it one of their awful names. They have named his sword Excalibur. Thinking now in terms of awful names, Heifel thought of his own. Someday will I have the courage to discard the name Heifel and go by my real name, the name my father gave me, the proud name of Lancelot? Heifel's musings about his name ceased when Beowulf said, The sky lightens. Time has come to rouse my crew and sail with the tide. But wait a moment. I have a gift for the young princess. Reaching to his cloak, he continued, I regret that my ale loosened the tongue of one of Gavin's soldiers, and his words brought her grief. Perhaps this will lighten her spirits. He handed Heifel a small, beautiful carved image of a hammer. It's called Molinar, the weapon of one of our gods, said Beowulf. Then he asked, you, Gavin, and others simply call this young princess the child, but by what name is she known? Heifel had to pause a moment to think. We called the child because in a fortnight she will be out of her charge and none, no, none of us expect to hear of her again. Gavin told us her Irish name is pronounced Gwyneth, but in the language Athlon, Gwyneth becomes Guinevere. Thank you, Marty. Up next, we have Haley Moon. Haley is an Alabama native and started writing at the age of 10 when she was given her first journal by her mother. She believes in writing without bounds and has written stories that have spanned the genres of horror, sci-fi, and the supernatural, but she has a proclivity for noir. You can find her short stories on vocal media and her website. When she isn't writing, she is mother to two playful and demanding felines and works as a polymer scientist. Today, Haley will be reading Cure, Wellness Required, a story centered on a dystopic future where wellness is sanctioned by the government and promised by a mega corporation led by a CEO who believes that first do no harm does not apply when faced with the scientific progress and discovery. Tim will stop at nothing to see his vision of a society free of neurological disease come to fruition, but at what cost? Thank you. 
A dull thud was followed by more blood spatter forming an odd pattern. And Tim watched in fascination as the man continued banging his head against the wall. A fifth bang brought with it another blood splatter, this time further up the wall, the crisscrossing of the dotted lines creating an abstract design. Tim's mind went to fractals as he tried to find something recognizable in the bloody mural. Jim, our patient 1099, started howling and moaning as he continued in his manic state. Weak, Tim whispered to himself. The in-house nurse looked up at him in horror. Sir, she asked puzzled, what do we do now? She turned back toward Jim. The man had started clawing at his skin, trailing marks down his tanned, uh, chubby cheeks. Tim's top lip rose in disgust. Nothing. You don't want us to stop him? He asked, confused as she watched the man pace before he turned toward them. He had his eyes downcast, his feet slightly apart. Suddenly, he ran toward the glass, his head parallel with the floor. It collided with the solid, smooth surface, but the force and the slickness of the glass pushed his head to one side, the weight of his body forcing the left side of his neck flush against it. Even through the thick pain, Tim heard the snap as the neck bent to a 90 degree angle. The patient's body hit the floor and the nurse screamed. Shut up, he hissed at her. Nancy immediately complied, placing her hand over her mouth. He shook his head, sighing. How are the others, the ones we gave the CT in? Um, I, she trailed off, still shaking from the scene she had just witnessed. Speak, woman, he shouted, causing the young man to drop the coffee he was carrying. The older, tall, robust CEO turned toward him and glared. Was that mine? Tim's gaze dropped to the venti Starbucks cup lying in the dark, wide puddle. The newly hired lab tech was shaking, beads of sweat forming at his temples. He nodded, keeping his eyes on the black floor mats. Tim hissed, stomping his foot. Why can't anyone goddamn speak? His voice echoed off the sterile white walls. Eileen stepped from behind the desk of computer screens and lab equipment. No one is speaking, Tim, because one, they are terrified of you, and two, everyone is still shaken from what they have just witnessed. She stopped next to Anthony. Why don't you go get another coffee here for the boss and don't drop it? She placed a 20 in his hand and flashed him a small smile. He whispered a quick thanks and hurried out of the lab. Tim dropped his shoulders, smirking. You're not afraid of me, and you people need to get over this. He glared at several people standing around in a small circle. He pointed backward at the glass enclosed room. It's a clinical trial. Sometimes they don't work, right? He looked at the team of scientists and medical staff. Some nodded, others kept their eyes on the floor. Well, they don't know you like I do. No one knows that you are a teddy bear covered in barbed wire with a razor blade in one hand and a piece of chocolate in the other. He chuckled, the smile making him appear to be an off season Santa. The laughter stopped abruptly and he was serious, his features hard as he stared at Eileen. The others, the C-10, how are we looking? She sighed, the playful banner over. Well, nothing as dramatic as what we just witnessed, but it's just as bad, maybe worse. A little girl in the children's wing took a pair of scissors and cut off two of her fingers. Geez, how old? Six. Damn the optics. He rubbed his hand down his face. Did you contact Sherry in PR? Yes, we followed the protocol. Even Dan was nice enough to come and stand over my shoulder as I talked to 1181's parents, she stated sarcastically. She sighed, we have to tell the board it doesn't work. The C-10 isn't working. We need more time. I'll let them know tomorrow that we need another eight months at minimum. If the government had a, hadn't done away with the animal trials, we wouldn't have all of this. Tim's eyes were wide. You will say nothing. Excuse me? She asked in disbelief. You want me to go in there tomorrow and lie? Tim, you know me. I won't stand up there and tell them this works, obviously. She just said toward the body bag the two scientists were struggling to carry. It doesn't. He put his hands up. Did Michelle give you the slides? She took off her glasses and placed them in the breast pocket of her lab coat. A man just died and you want to talk about presentation slides? He placed his hands in the pockets of his slacks. Damn it, Eileen, did she give you the slides? He was beginning to become annoyed. Yes, she did. And why the hell is the head of quality, quality telling me what I need to present to the board? 
and why is she giving me a pre-made pre presentation? My team has already put together our findings. He removed his hands from his pockets and placed them on her shoulders, giving them a firm squeeze. Please stick to the slides, Aline. She stepped back, breaking contact. I reviewed what she sent in the data. Not only does the results she stated don't add up, they're incorrect. He looked around and noticed several pairs of eyes on them. Don't you people have work to do? The onlookers scattered. Those at desk and lab benches began banging away on keyboards and staring at blank screens. My office. She followed in silence. During the ride from the basement to the 25th floor, she had tried to speak in the confinement of the elevator, but Tim held up his hand, pointing at the camera in the corner. Once in his office, he took a seat at his desk. Eileen stood, feeling uncomfortable in the large room. It had been years since she'd been, been in his office. Tim always preferred to meet in hers. She gave the room a quick once-over, taking in the many awards that littered the glass shelves. The small statues and plaques served as relics, reminding visitors of their boss's former greatness as a technology mogul. Silence dominated for several minutes as the two locked eyes. Tim's eyes, dark gray and hazy. Aline's a deep sea green, full of fire and rebellion. He spoke first. I know it doesn't work. I know everything you people do down there. It's simple, Aline. You will present the slides in the manner Michelle has given them to you. Any question the board asks tomorrow, I will answer, you understand? She ground her teeth before speaking. Once again, you want me to lie? You've lied before, Aline. We all have. You're not special. So get off your high horse. You remember Yale? We worked hard to make sure one knew, would make sure no one would know that your greatest scientific discovery was found by someone else. Alan Maeve, rang a bell. You weren't on campus at the time. You were giving birth, if I recall. Her ire began to grow. Yes, I was off campus and had been for months. Let's not forget, Tim, that was your son I was giving birth to, and that was 30 years ago. Alan has been dead just as long. Throughout my career, I have honored his memory. I gave him posthumous credit. He laughed. You put him in the damn footnotes. Aline stepped forward. This isn't up for discussion, and you won't guilt trip me about Alan. I know what happened that night with you, Alan and Nick, so don't go there. She approached the desk, pointing at him. I won't lie. It's that simple. She turned on her heels, leaving Tim fuming. He pulled the burner phone from under the false bottom in the top drawer and hit eight for speed dial. It rang twice before it was answered. There was no sound on the other end, but Tim knew to put in his order. Aileen Rosen. When? The voice was heavy and crisp. Tonight, and I needed to look accidental. Tim rubbed the sweat from his forehead on the back of his sleeve. Where? 3521 Severance Lane. Tim was met with a dial tone, but he knew. His guy was reliable. The man's fee would be within the account within the hour. He slowly laid the phone on the desk and chuckled. Yes, Aileen, it's that simple. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Next up, we have Benjamin y Hewitt. Um, Benjamin will be reading the opening segment to his action-packed dark fantasy novel, Blood and Bones, written under the pseudonym Monsoon117. Benjamin has been writing for several years now and hopes he will re enjoy this reimagining of one of his earlier works. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here. Okay. Sunlight beamed between branches while I wheezed, the taste of iron leaking in from my throat. I breathed hard enough to draw blood from my lungs, but I still slammed my feet into the forest floor one leg following the other. My throat burned, my chest hammered with the hum of my heart, and I reached my limit, my jaw slackening from the effort, but it wasn't enough. Behind me, the forest leaves and brambled bushes rustled from footsteps. Some of the bullkin jumped between branches, darting with superhuman speed. Others ran upon all fours like hungry dogs, and they foamed at the mouth to match that canine comparison. 
Despite their gruesome appearances, they were all human, but they mirrored monsters as they hunted me. Desperate to escape them, I slid down a hill, having played in these dark woods since I was a child. Thorny briars slapped across my face, drawing blood across my cheeks. Branches whipped against my arms and neck, and the cool air stung against those cuts. They dried in the wind, sealing shut as I made more wounds with my frantic sprint. My desperation didn't save me. The bloodkin behind smelled my wounds and hunted me down. As they came closer, my mind raced for ways to evade my pursuers. Gritting my teeth, I grunted in frustration as only despair flooded through my chest. My people were gone. Sadness shifted to anger and vengeance, but I swallowed those emotions and pressed onward. In time, I would kill them all, but not today. While I scrambled up a hill, then down a ravine, a dark figure passed beside me. Its steps rumbled the ground as if tiny earthquakes erupted from its heels. In all other circumstances, a shadow in the deep wood meant death. For me, the monster omened a chance at life. However, before I could divert it to my enemies, the dark figure dispersed into the shade. It disintegrated as if it never existed. So my sudden hope fizzled. My chest sank as the beast disappeared. Beside me, a bloodkin jumped from the trunk of a tree, darting in my way. He slid on the leaves, staying on his heels and maintaining balance. Four of his companions chased behind him, so this might be my only chance to fight one of them at once. Seizing the opportunity, I raised my hands towards the warrior. Covered in the flowing robes of the bloodkin, the warrior smiled at me. He murmured, so the child wants to fight. That's how all bonesmen wish to die, their hands raised and teeth bared like animals. Typical bloodkin. Instead of blathering, I stepped forward. Um, I stepped towards him while he talked, and that closed the gap between us. I threw out a quick punch, and he darted under it, leaping away. I scoffed, coward. Low to the ground, the bloodkin spun in a circle. He grabbed the stick and slammed it towards me. I kept my feet grounded while lifting my arm. From under my skin, umbral shards of bone burst outward. Against my reinforced limb, the dry log crumbled to powder before I dashed towards my enemy. He slid away, but not before I grabbed his sleeve. I jerked him back, and his momentum hurled him off his feet before I slammed him down. I raised a hand high, and dark bone covered my fist. Taking no chances, I struck his face into the ground. The leaves billowed out from around the bloodkin, and bone crushed bone. He was gone. I blinked, my vision spinning. I stood while taking a few steps back. My labored breathing turned to rapid gasps as I held down the urge to vomit. I stumbled over to a tree before emptying out my breakfast. Another blood king caught, to me, caught up to me, this one armored in the leather of magical beasts. I winced as the blonde-haired enemy gazed at his fallen comrade. His eyes grew bloodshot and he roared, You murderer! At my sides, my hands trembled from hearing his accusation. He was wrong, of course. These hunters aimed to kill me, so I defended myself. It was that simple in theory, but in practice, I believed what he said. Staring down at that body, that reality only set in deeper. I was a murderer, and yet I didn't have any time to grapple with that fact. I stopped the shaking of one hand and pointed it at the blonde-haired bloodkin. I jeered. He died like a peeled scab. That wasn't true. His friend died with honor, but Blondie believed me. In a fit of rage, the bloodkin bit into his thumbs. Trails of his icy blood spiraled around him, and he lifted his hands. The white spirals wrapped together into shards of ice. He growled, you're a liar. He threw his arms, the lances behind his head launching towards me. I dashed behind a tree, and with my back to the thick oak, three pointed spikes of ice sliced out of the trunk. I gazed at my reflection in one of them, my face covered in grime and blood. Grabbing the ice, I snapped the sharp shard before rolling out from behind cover. As I did, Blondie tossed a massive javelin of ice through the tree. It erupted from the wooden trunk like an explosion of splinters and snow. Using the distraction, 
I threw my ice shards towards the enraged bloodkin. Ice met flesh, and it gouged into Blondie's neck. The, the shattered tree fell as he did, and the trunk landed between us, sparing me the sight of his demise. I stared down at my arm, having never killed anyone before, let alone two people. I grabbed the sides of my head, my hands interlocking with my hair, and I pulled. The fresh pain knocked me out of my trance. Giving myself some slaps on the side of my face, I was back in the present, mostly. At that moment, three bloodkin jumped through the branches of the fallen tree, one murmuring to the other, isn't he still a kid? How did he kill two already? Another answered, his bone power awakened today. Don't underestimate him, or we'll end up like Islor and Nack. I peered at the three of them, the names Islor and Nack ringing in my ears. I killed them. Nausea spread through my chest while my knees weakened. I caught myself from stumbling before I gulped. Instead of falling, I spread my arms while feigning confidence. It looks like you all want to follow them to the nether. Amping up my bluff, I released my blackened bones, the extra plates coursing to the surface of my skin. A few dark panels covered my shoulders, chest, and forearms. The most cautious of the bloodkin narrowed his eyes at me, his orange hair sheening like fire under a beam of light. He jeered. Yes, yes, yes. We can tell you've barely developed your skeleton at all. You look weak. He was right. The aging ceremony happened today, and I hadn't even cultivated a single stone, let alone a vein of minerals. However, I had one trump card up my sleeve. I murmured, have you ever seen blackened bones before? Hmm? There's a reason for that. The three blood king gazed at one another before their eyes locked in on me. The orange-haired leader stared with eyes like slits. So what? Your bone power is unique, but that doesn't mean it's powerful. He took a step forward, and a spike of panic shot through my chest like a wooden stake. My stomach sank as a scowl formed on the cautious blood king. He snapped, circle around him. We'll handle this by the book. Not that this bonesman knows what one is. The cautious leader cut his palms with blades on his wrists, and his blood mirrored his hair. The orange liquid entangled into plumes of fire. I gasped as he lifted his hands, an inferno spilling towards me. I closed my eyes and covered my face, knowing I was dead. The heat burned strands of my hair before the ground in front of me quaked. I peered up as a deep cold replaced the surging heat. The shadowy figure from earlier stood in front of me. Its colossal form loomed overhead. It was a titanic skeleton of gilded, shining bones, and the behemoth peered at those present with disdain. I panicked as cool sweat dripped down my back. The giant murmured to me with a voice like metal. Ah, a fellow bonesman. Tell me, what era is this? Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Up next, we have Jason Head. Jason works for the state of Alabama and has a passion for photography and writing. In addition to writing, he is interested in getting into audiobook narration. His friends at Write Club highly support this interest, and after hearing him today, we're sure you will too. Today, Jason will be reading a passage entitled Judd Robinson from his book, A Southern Family, a memoir. The Hood family produced an abundance of nefarious people. There was my grandfather's numerous forays into brewing moonshine whiskey and his brothers who helped him. There were relatively harmless cousins who lived by their wits, but even they, when they were forced to, would work at some meaningful endeavor. And then there was Judd Robinson. Judd was a born con artist. He had a careless air about him that easily lent itself to shamelessness. He had no hesitation when it came to scheming and lying. He was not a typically lucky man when it came to gambling, hence his penchant for it. Consequently, his life resembled a continuous pattern of escaping 
eluding and evading. When your entire life is based on a series of casual lies, you will ultimately go on the run from someone, some place, some situations, or all of them at once. He ran from car dealers, relatives, wives, betrayed husbands, creditors of every kind, and anyone else that he owed money to. He had a certain charisma, a bon vivant, joie de vivre, that would let him get away with taking clothes right out of your closet and not returning them. Women were especially susceptible to his considerable charms. He would steal something and disappear somewhere, usually another state for a year or so until his, the stink of his misdeeds had dissipated, and then return for another round of debauchery and cunning. He made no apologies and admitted no regrets. If God hadn't meant for me to take people to the cleaners, he wouldn't have made them so stupid, was a favorite motto. His lifestyle led to various methods of acquiring money with the least amount of effort. He had no sense of moderation. If he came into money, he spent it quickly in the pursuit of women or gambling it away on long shots. He constantly chose long odds, believing that one day he would make the one bet that would make him wealthy beyond his most vulgar imagination. His scheming was born of a single seminal event in his life that happened in his childhood and not surprisingly involved my own grandfather, Jim. Judd made 50 cents one day when he was all of seven years old. For perhaps the only time in his life, he had made money by honestly running errands for people who needed things done. Judd took the money home and showed it to his stepfather with the hope of receiving some kind word for his effort. Judd's stepfather, a man with his own scurrilous reputation, held the boy down and took the money from him. He then rounded up my grandfather and they wasted the money on whiskey at the Bloody Bucket, a joint on the brow of Sand Mountain. I swore right then and there I'd never be without money again, ever, Judd told my daddy. Instead of it motivating the boy to do something positive, taking his hard-earned 50 cents had the complete opposite effect. Judd was hustling pool at 12 and learning how to cheat at cards at 13. He bought two fighting cocks and sought out Jim's advice on how to train them. By 14, he had left school and was stealing radios and cars. He evaded the draft in the Second World War by having no permanent address and going to jail. In January 1942, with the country in a self-righteous panic and girding for a prolonged fight, Judd, with the help of one of my grandfather's brothers, stole a brand new Plymouth. They sold it and Judd absconded to Chicago with a share of the loot. One of Jim's other brothers, Don, had possessed the wisdom to see, but most importantly, to leave an area of the country that would never give anyone any kind of living other than farming. Don went to Chicago and rarely returned to Alabama. Judd turned up on Don's doorstep at dinner one night worn out and hungry after a week of hitchhiking. Within a month, the money he had made selling the stolen vehicle was gone, probably to someone in Chicago who was a little bit better pool shark. Although Don had begun making a decent living in a meatpacking plant, Judd had no intention of trying anything legitimate. One afternoon, Don came home and found a note lying on his kitchen table. Gone back to Alabama. Judd was all it said. He arrived back in Alabama starved to death and looking worse. He quickly stole another car, was apprehended, and by the fall of 1942 was serving two years at Kilby Prison. Jail only made him tougher by teaching him how to box. He claimed some shadowy Golden Gloves title by the time he emerged a free man in the late summer of 1944. While other men were on the verge of defeating Nazism, Judd went back to chasing women and concocting his next big score. His favorite scheme would almost always involve a woman. I'm just as good as Clyde Barra, only smarter and better looking, he bragged. 
Judd was no barrel. He lacked the true guts to hold anyone at gunpoint and take money right out of their pocket. The murderously cold mentality of a killer never inhabited his psychology. He was simply having fun. The problem was that he had to sneak most of the time to have it. Perhaps the most astonishing aspect of Judd's existence was his ability to encourage people to take up for him. The hood women constantly defended him, even in the face of obvious guilt. Every one of them thought Judd was incomparably handsome. My own grandmother Kate forever sang his praises. If Judd went to Hollywood, Errol Flynn would be out of business in a week. Bud possessed a healthy crop of jet black hair and the blue eyes that were common to hoods. He wasn't tall, but he wasn't short either. His physique was nothing that would cause women to stare from a distance. At Sunday gatherings, the hood women would invariably turn to the subject of him. Have you seen him lately? They would ask in a hushed tone, as if Judd were some strange conglomeration of Lucifer and Houdini. All of them sought his favor. To the older ones, he was like a beloved nephew. To the younger ones, a venerated uncle. His demeanor and wit could be razor sharp or as mellow as a crooner, depending on which would suit him best at the moment. Impervious Annie, suspicious of almost any man, could easily be swayed by Judd's charms. She hid him from the law on numerous occasions and once put him on a bus to Atlanta in the dead of night with money she had made herself. Judd was Sheriff John Evans' favorite suspect. If anything of value in Marshall County went missing, especially an automobile, Evans would not be far away. Consequently, Bud went on the lamb even when he was innocent. It only added to the legend. Judd's own last name embellished his rakish existence, pervading an air of romantic infamy whenever he was mentioned. As a child, I heard some of the hoods pronounce his name Robinson, and others pronounced it Robison. Maiden aunts were the most frequent offenders of simple pronunciation. It was a name that was easily garbled when you had a bottom lip full of snuff. There were occasions when the same person referred to Judd Robinson one minute and Judd Robinson the next. On occasion, I even heard him referred to as Judge Robinson, which made him all the more mystifying to someone in grade school. I thought anyone who was a judge most surely have a magisterial aura about himself. But if you were a hood or one of the cousins, it mattered not how the name was verbalized. All you had to say was Judd. Thank you, Jason. Up next, we have W.B. Henley. W.B. Henley is a geologist who knows that even stones tell stories if you are patient enough to read them. He recently made the short list in the Faulkner Wisdom Creative Writing Competition for short stories and took second place for his short story submitted to the annual Alabama Writers Cooperative Writing Competition. When not hammering rocks, he hammers out stories on his laptop. He is currently working on a dark story about murder in a hot southern town. If you have a few minutes, he'd love to tell you about it. Today, he'll be sharing the first two chapters of his no novel in progress, Inescapable. Thank you. I wanted to say a couple of things uh, first. Thanks first for having me. And secondly, I wanted to uh, make sure that everybody reads banned books, okay? <laughs> Chapter one, Buck. Everything happens for a reason. That's what the preacher said at Mama's funeral, the kind of thing a preacher says at any funeral, I suppose. I remember the sun shining on her through this clear glass halo around a cross on the window. Her body looked fake, like a plastic mannequin with Mama's face painted on it. My stepfather, Leon, stood to the side of the casket. 
Teresa hit against the back of his shoulder. Before the doors opened for visitors, Leon told me it was best if I stayed in the pew. The grieving widower smiled each time someone offered respects. I pictured him counting the hugs and the handshakes like tickets to the show. Once they paid their admission, the good folks lingered for a long time at the casket, examining the body, looking for marks. Finally, they slow walked past me, the suspected mother murderer sitting stone-faced in the shadows. I kept my eyes on the halo in the window to avoid their looks. When the time came, Leon led Teresa to the aisle end of our pew. My half-sister was only 11, but she held up well until the last walk past her mama. When they closed the lid, she sobbed uncontrollably. When the preacher began his sermon, an angry jaybird hit the window behind the pulpit as if it wanted to break the glass and kill its own reflection. While the preacher quoted his verses, the bird attacked again and again. The slams grew louder. Everything happens for a reason, said the preacher. The jaybird threw the full force of its body into the window and everybody gasped. <clears throat> The preacher turned to watch, but the bird never returned, either too stunned or too dead to keep up the fight. Evil things happen, the preacher finally said. Bad things that sometimes, sometimes, he said again to make sure he was clear, we don't understand. I felt the stares, cold eyes that had already decided, cold minds that wouldn't change. I'd grown used to it, the cold. At the time, I even preferred it. It made me numb, and anything that numbed the beast was fine with me. I wanted the cold. I needed the cold to keep the heat damp down because that's what I was afraid of, the beast, the crazy anger, the madness, the heat that chased everybody from my life. Three weeks before, Teresa found us in the snow. Her scream didn't even move me at first, just another blast of winter wind. We looked frozen, she said, my head down on Mama's chest, neither one of us moving my eyes closed, Mama's eyes open, pale, empty, lifeless, still staring at what came for her and left her dead. Teresa kept screaming, wouldn't stop screaming, shrill, harsh, accusing. The sound finally cut through the fog. I lifted my eyes towards her but kept my head down like I was in a howling windstorm. Teresa's face was contorted and it wrenched me back to reality. It was pure fear, and fear meant hot-blooded life. But at that moment, I didn't want life. All I wanted was to die and leave all the heat behind. I wanted to join my mother in death, empty, cold death. When Teresa's words fully formed in my brain, they filled all the empty spaces and swelled so fast, I could almost feel the blood trickling from my ears. The fear crept inside me. Buck, she screamed, what did you do? I don't think it rained a drop for months after Mama died. Like God forgot how to cry, if he ever knew how. I don't know, maybe he was waiting on me to cry first. My stepfather cleared the new field that summer just to give me something to build a fence around, I suppose. I didn't mind work. It kept me busy, kept me from thinking too hard, kept me in shape for football, the only place where I could let the beast out, the only place I could hit people and be rewarded for it, the only place it felt good to be angry. Leon laid out the little orange flags like tiny soldiers, perfectly spaced at six-foot intervals. I imagined them on a parade ground, ordered by Leon to advance to the end of the field, execute a perfect column lift, march on for another eighth of a mile, and then stand at attention, awaiting their fate. My orders were simple. Join them, post hole diggers at the ready, and bury them where they were placed. Leon Bustard cuts a small figure, though he does his best to look bigger, feet apart, shoulders back, crisp khaki shirt tucked neatly into a pair of creased denim jeans, which were themselves tucked into a polished pair of leather boots. He never served, yet on his arm he sports a skull tattoo wearing a sergeant's hat. On his own head he wears a clean tan Stetson designed to show who owns the ranch, even though only two of the five steers he bought at auction earlier had survived the summer so far. The other three he shot when they didn't get on their feet quickly enough. Yet he had me building another fence around another pasture. On the day the Alabama temperature hit 100, Leon came to inspect his troops. Not even halfway finished, you gonna make it? His voice betrayed more than a hint of satisfaction. Go a lot faster with a tractor, I said. 
Leon pulled the water cooler from the truck bed and glared at me red-faced from under his hat. See that fence? He motioned to the other side of the road and spit the words out through his clenched teeth. Nearly a mile of it, and every damn post I put in by hand. Yeah, I mumbled, you told me. Brought your water because of the heat. Didn't affect your attitude any. Leon dropped the cooter back in the truck. I'll send your sister to check on you later. A cloud from his spinning tires wrapped me in a dull brown fog. And I hid there for a few seconds until the hot wind brushed it away. A couple of hours later, Teresa puttered up on her four-wheeler. Strapped behind her was a water cooler Leon had left in the kitchen. A spray of crimson dahlias cradled in her lap. Daddy said you might need this, she said, thumbing at the cooler. The little man taketh, the little man giveth. She looked at me blankly as if she didn't hear. At least God had not taken everybody away. Not yet. Thanks, I said. My face was streaked with the dirt and sweat. I lifted the cooler to drink straight from the tap. Teresa, who had fallen in love with Robinson Crusoe a few moments before, laughed. You look like a washed up castaway. Oh, I'm not the castaway, I said in the lowest voice I could muster. I crouched and aimed an imaginary spear at my kid half-sister. I'm the headhunter. Before she could start the machine again, I grabbed her by the shoulders. At first, I got to boil ya. She wriggled out of my grasp and fell, and the dahlias spilled into little splatters of red on the dead grass. Stop, she yelled. Now look what you made me do. I knelt and picked them up, 12 of them, two for each month since Mama passed. Ah, they're all right. Just need a little water, that's all. I baptized each flower in the cooler until the dirt was all gone and then soaked my crusty t-shirt in the water and squeezed out the salt several times. Teresa appeared at the brown water. Ooh, you're going to drink that? No, I'm going to throw it on you, I said, and faked a step toward her. Instead, I wrapped the flowers and handed her the bundle. Here, I said, say hello to Mama for me. I watched her disappear in the shadows past the scrub trees lining the field headed toward the bottom where the creek used to run until the water dried up like everything else. I waited until the sound of the engine died and the quiet smacked me into a vision of the stream where I'd found her mother six months ago to the day, face down in the water. Looking down the long line of flags marking my path, I shook my head and returned to work. If this was my destiny, then so be it. And I pounded on the brick hard clay until I dug another hole and set another post and poured another bag of concrete to seal another poor soldier in his place. Thank you. Up next, we have Nancy Dorman Hickson. Nancy is originally from Mississippi, but has lived in, Al in Birmingham for decades. She was a features editor with Progressive Farmer and Southern Living for many years and is now a freelance writer. She's also the co-author of Diplomacy and Diamonds, the memoir of Joanne King Herring, a Texas woman portrayed by Julia Roberts in the Tom Hanks movie, Charlie Wilson's War. Today, Nancy will be reading a section titled Angel Babies from her memoir in progress. Her memoir is a story of love, loss, and awakening, weaving scenes from a family in rural Mississippi in the 1960s and 70s with a present day Southern woman's account from Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful day. Angel babies. I'm five months along and on strict bed rest for the rest of my pregnancy. I rub my big belly swollen with my unborn twin children. A few days ago, a delivery woman rings my doorbell. When I waddle up to the entrance and open the door, the sight of my huge body must have been like suddenly stumbling upon a beached whale. The surprised woman let out an involuntary cry. Oh my, she yelps. She immediately stammers an apology, embarrassed by her outburst. It's all right, I replied dryly. It's an oh my situation. My babies tried to arrive much too early while I was at work a couple of weeks ago. I am hospitalized. After an eventful night of touch and go, the premature labor is stopped with drugs. But the episode means I will spend the remainder of my pregnancy at home, restricted to a sofa or a bed. During the day, I'm at home by myself while my husband Mark is at work. I'm like some pregnant Victorian woman under confinement, I wail when he comes home. 
One day, my dad shows up unexpectedly. He makes himself a cup of coffee and sits on a chair near the blue and white sofa where I lay sideways. My stomach is sprawled on the flattened cushion beneath me. Eventually, my heavy body will exert so much pressure on this particular spot, the fabric will tear and a hole will spread wider and wider. What do you do all day, Daddy asked. I imagine he's thinking about how his hyper self would implode under similar circumstances. Even now, after only a half hour of sitting, his foot is twitching and his body squirms with restlessness. I work some using a laptop, I reply, referring to my job as a magazine editor. But my boss told me to concentrate on getting the babies here healthy. Mostly, I keep up with medical stuff I have to do. I have gestational diabetes. It's not unusual to get diabetes during pregnancy with multiple babies, my doctor explained. You're trying to get rid of sugars for three people. After each meal, I prick my finger to make sure the diabetes is controlled. To monitor contractions, twice a day, I strap a belt to my abdomen. If I have too many contractions, I have to return to the dreaded hospital. At home, medicine controls the contractions, first with a capsule and then with medicine administered with a leg pump. When the pump needs to be renewed, sweat pours from my forehead and my hands shake when I slam the device's needle into my thigh. Two years from now, the medicine I'm using will be banned as a means to prevent early labor. It will be linked to congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema in previously healthy women. In infants, it will also be connected to autism, brain damage, speech defects, delayed cognition, learning disabilities, and movement disorders. The medicine is proven especially dangerous for those women like me who take it for months on end. But none of this is known at this point. In fact, my visiting home nurse tells me, oh, you're so lucky. The babies I've been around whose moms use breathine are always good babies, no colic. I tell my dad, mostly I drink water all day and go to the bathroom. A gigantic water pitcher sits inches away rebuking me if I'm not chugging H2O. Staying hydrated keeps the contractions down, I explain. Just the thought of all that water makes me heave myself up and shuffle to the nearest bathroom again. Daddy's eyes widen when he sees my girth up close and personal. He almost topples his chair in his haste to move out of my way. You better quit getting up so much, he says nervously. I imagine he is fearful he might be called upon to deliver a baby or two if I suddenly go into labor. I doubt he'd get on an elevator with me. Through gritted teeth, I reply, did I not mention the gallons of water I have to drink? I steer the conversation elsewhere. The nurse told me she had one client on bed rest who went shopping and another one who went fishing. You don't mean it, Daddy says. He seems as surprised as I am that mothers-to-be would risk their unborn children's lives. But I'm the one shocked by Daddy's next comment. He says, you know your mama was a twin. He says this casually, as if reconfirming something I already knew. But what, what are you talking about, I respond after I've closed my mouth. I thought you knew. Your grandmother was pregnant with twins, but she lost one of them. It honestly doesn't occur to me, nor to Daddy, I'm guessing, that this is a fairly insensitive topic for a pregnant mother on bed rest to hear. I should have asked, was the baby stillborn? Did she miscarry? What happened? I asked nothing. Instead, I say, you could have warned me twins run in the family. Years later, I reach out to my siblings, hoping that they'll have answers about my maternal grandmother and my mother's lost twin. I'm pretty sure the twin was stillborn, my oldest sister responds. But when I order a copy of my mother's birth certificate, there's no record of a second baby. I conclude my grandmother experienced something called vanishing twin, where one fetus dies in utero, but the other baby survives. Learning about my mother's missing twin seems to open me up to discovering other lost babies in our family history. My cousin Charlotte tells me of two other babies who were stillborn after my mother's birth. Charlotte's father recalled going with his father to bury one of those infants. I think about my grandfather, the father of that deceased child, as he gently lifts the tiny swaddled bundle. The weight of its slight body must have felt as if he were holding air. I envision him taking careful measured steps to the ground he has prepared with the heft of his lively child in one arm 
and the burden of his dead child in the other. When her dad tells Charlotte that story, my cousin says, Oh, Daddy, did it scar you? I can't believe he took you along to bury a baby. Her dad replies, matter-of-factly, it was different in those days. There were dead babies all the time then. I began to agree with him when I recall a similar tragedy on my father's side of the family. When my dad was six, his brother lived only 46 days before succumbing to polio. Daddy was quarantined from school that year, my older sister says. I think about my paternal grandmother feeding, bathing, diapering, and rocking to sleep her second boy for only 46 brief days. Did she notice beginning polio symptoms, or was her baby's death devastatingly sudden? When faced with grief about children that they love dying, how did the women in my family cope? I lie on the sofa so very pregnant and wonder if I will have to face this same impossibility with my own babies. I hold tightly to the power of hope, praying into existence the two beings now growing in my body. A half-remembered Bible verse peppers my prayers. The psalm about babies being knitted together in mother's wombs, fearfully and wonderfully made. I dream about my twins' future lives. Will they feel the other's absence when they're away from each other? Will they feel pain when the other is hurt? Will they share a tie that supersedes other relationships? Already, while their bodies develop, I share a link with them more powerful than anything I've ever experienced. I know that bond will never be severed by birth or even by death. Already, my life is intertwined with theirs, as it was for my mother, my mother's mother, and my father's mother, and all of their angel babies. When my entire pregnancy cycle is complete and my twins finally emerge, I am in awe of the two miracles that unfold, each baby possessing 10 tiny fingers and toes, loud working lungs, and eyes that fiercely track my familiar voice. The dangerous drug I took leaves no mark on the babies or me. They are glowingly healthy, their bodies are lively 6 pounds 8 ounces and 5 pounds 11 ounces. For me, there are no breathless babies born into stillness or silence shortly after birth. I hold my children close, kiss their dewy crowns, and whisper a prayer of thanksgiving into that thin place between living and dying, between flesh and spirit. I direct my prayer to God, the maker and creator of all that is and all that shall be. But I direct my prayers also to the mothers and babies who came before me, especially those of my kin, whose blood my son and daughter share and honor with their very lives. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Up next, we have Michael Verga. Youngest son of Vincent and Virginia Ruth, Michael Verga received his bachelor's in English from Birmingham Southern College. Growing up, his grandmother nurtured his natural creativity, and at age 30, Michael dedicated himself to his calling, poetry. Now in his mid-60s, he hopes he is aging artistically, and as a young senior citizen, as he likes to call himself, he can often be found reading and writing in the computer lab at the Hoover Senior Center. This is Michael's sixth presentation of poetry since 2009. This year, he brings a narrative bow to March's month-long celebration of women by sharing a journal poem from March of 1997, which received an honorable mention on the Interboard Poetry Community's monthly competition in March of 2004. For your reading convenience, there is a QR code link in the program, um, and you can scroll about a third of the way down the page to find The Art of Woman and read along if you like. Here's Michael. Good afternoon. Art of Woman. Winter Wednesdays in a museum studio. I sit, stand, and strike poses in full attire for drawing from a live model. An art class composed of women instructed by a woman artist. 
At first, the view lacked perspective, but our humors were as clay balanced and shaped in time, the space soon becoming focused as a closer rapport took form. They all agreed I was a suitable subject. By the second week, I discovered the cafe upstairs. I met the lady manager and we too made a working acquaintance. She allowed me ice water at break times and once on a Saturday when I was short on change, her cashier Lulu lent me the 50 cents I needed for a Neapolitan pastry. Back in the studio, Rolina presented a colorful comparison to illustrate a 3D drawing technique. Imagine while drawing Michael's image being carved in the round of an apple pulp. We all found the viable analogy in good humor. I responded by adding the figure was pleasing to my poetic energies. Perhaps it would appear in one of my writings. And as they were drafting, I was drifting back to a younger time, sitting at the kitchen table of a kind, gray-haired Mediterranean woman, her gently wrinkled hand caressing my brown, curly hair, making me stronger by blessing me with Sistine memories to keep us secured as we travel in different realms, but never really apart. When even smaller, I would rest on the living room carpet at her feet. She dozes in her crescent chair while I watch the television. The variation on the third turned into communal reward as I sat in calm repose, watching too as students attentively observed the master artist spend the first 20 minutes rendering in charcoal on blue gray quality paper, the face of a man child, the pensive aspect of a poet. At the close of our midterm meeting, she offered, signed and dated the fine portrait after I expressed how it would make a great gift for my father's birthday tomorrow. The next week, I brought in a concrete poem, a picture painted with words, signed and dated, about a cathedral castle constructed in honor of a legendary lady. I recited it for her and her students, wearing the chap cap she placed on my head, sitting in a reading position while they were drawing the planes of the face, the lengths of arms and legs, the contours of torso and shoulders. Slightly surreal describes the fifth, a warm winter day and beneath a blue hooded lightweight jacket, I wore my black Matisse t-shirt with the red sphere in the chest of a dark silhouette floating through a yellow starry midnight blue sky. Then midway through, one blonde lady in love with learning and so with living told us she had a vision of Michael in her dream the week before. I waited a polite pause before inquiring. She responded, she just remembered when she woke my image from the night before and in the morning after, her husband explained how artists often see in their sleep their models she had missed that week. I told them the way pre-Raphaelites, 19th century painter poets, held close ties with their models. From the chair on the platform, I continued on about Rodin and his model, Ruby Muse and mistress Camille Claudel, leading me to mention the Jungian idea about how the silver touch of a good woman molds bronze and empowers a man. Like when love gave the old man Rodin new wings. At their request, I read my latest lyric about inspiration from new experiences found while engaged in a concurrent workshop where I was a visiting poet. And on the sixth Wednesday, 
while they are putting on the finishing touches, I will recite this one for them, along with La Dieta, dedicated to my father's mother. She asked them for the love and nothing, nothing more. An art poem, given color to marble, justified to the left, since recently studied and revised again, mostly by women. The postlude. After announcing the final selection as the poetic documentation, a reading between the lines of our ongoing collaboration, we decided I would deliver the overview as a serial during our three pauses. They would step back to inspect their progress and listened with interest to a wordsmith's voice, recollecting in phases the creation from our lines. The recitation, including the cameo piece, was well received with respect to us all. We all agreed. We were an inspiration to each other. As a memoir, I made a visit to and took a farewell look at each easel to compliment their compositions, to remember their styles. A young mother and graphic artist presented me her drawing with my profile bowed to the left. We noticed a resemblance to, St we noticed a resemblance to Sting. I asked if they had seen him on the television performing live at the Music Awards the night before. And did they know? He used to be an English professor before he became a successful songwriter. For Virginia Ruth. For Virginia Ruth, where you go, I go too. And tomorrow, tomorrow it still truly is like sailing through the aesthetic channels of one of her son's romantic themes. Like how the soaring Phoenix song does need the voice of the white winged dove and the flight of the Merlin Falcon to ride above these graceless days as fine skylark forever fearlessly enchanted, just like one upon a time treasured by the ones brave to hold on to it. Then the crowd continued to cheer, and the only price was the elemental performance of a pure compassion play, so that the chain does go undaunted to match the beauty again. And all she ever wanted was for them to know there is no ending. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Up next, we have Bobby Matthews. Bobby lives in Bluff Park, and when he's not writing fiction, he's covering sports in suburban Birmingham. Bobby is the author of the forthcoming novels Living the Gimmick, May 2022, and Magic City Blues, February 2023, from Shotgun Honey Books. He's also the co-editor of Dirty South, High Crimes and Low Lives Below the Mason-Dixon Line, forthcoming in 2023 from Down and Out Books. Bobby was a finalist for the 2021 Derringer Award for his story, Quitman County Ambush, which he will be reading here for us today. Including, included in your program notes is a QR link to the story if you'd like to read along. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I wanted to, uh, before I start, I wanted to, to thank Melanie, who has done a ton of work behind the scenes to set all of this up. Just a tremendous job. I also want to say hello to Joe Crow. I see you over there. Wonderful to see you come out. <clears throat> this is Quitman County Ambush, originally published in Bristol Noir. Uh, this is my also my time to tell you that I write Southern Noir, crime, and uh, fiction that has an edge to it. So if... Uh, violence or uh, adult themes bother you, this is your content warning for that. Um, <clears throat> you know what he's doing, don't you? Mikey took a hard pull from the bottle of wild turkey and passed it on. Every week you see him out on the water. 
Sure, Carl said. Man likes to fish. The man in question was Judge Harlan Baker. If any one person owned Quitman County, it was Judge Baker. Everyone called him the hanging judge, even though nobody swung from the gallows in Georgia since Arthur Myers took the long drop in 1931 over in Augusta. But Judge Baker was mean as hell and everybody knew it. He never cut a man any slack at all. If you came before the bench on his docket, you were getting the maximum sentence. If handing out the max ever bothered Judge Baker, he didn't show it. Not on the weekends we saw him anyway. Walter George Lake, that's uh, Lake Eufaula, if you put in from the Alabama side, is supposed to be the large mouth bass capital of the world, and every weekend the lake's lousy with assholes trying to prove it's true. The judge is one of them. We've been watching him for three weeks now, and if you think fishing is boring, you ought to try watch somebody else do it. Bribe money, Sean said. Gotta be. That's what y'all say, I said, but we don't know for sure. Bullshit, Mikey said. You're just scared. Mikey could talk that way. He was the one with the gun. I shrugged and looked away from him. No one said anything else. Carl went back to rolling a joint, and pretty soon he had it going, and acrid sweet smoke filled the air. They passed it around between the four of them. I wanted my head clear, not baked. We took turns watching the judge paddle a flat-bottomed aluminum boat a quarter of a mile along the Georgia side of the shore, in no hurry, trolling a line in the water. Occasionally, he'd drop anchor and flick a lure near the bank where the tall grass could hide bass of considerable size. He rarely caught anything, and when he did, he threw it back. The first time I saw that, I laughed and handed the, car the binoculars to Carl, who took them with an unspoken question on his face. I didn't say anything. Carl wouldn't have understood the irony of a man with Judge Baker's reputation practicing catch and release. The judge fished all the way over to the Alabama side, making a day of it. He packed the boat with everything an angler would need, rods and reels, bait, tackle box, ice chest. And every time he came back from his visit across the water, he carried something extra. Sometimes the black nylon backpack bulged, swinging pendulously. Other times it was nearly flat, but it was always there when he came back and it hadn't been there when he left. There were five of us on the job and our plan was simple, watch him. And when he brought back a bag that looked particularly full, we'd make our move. It was almost November and cold with fog rising along the lake at dawn and settling back down at dusk, making the familiar shape of the lake shore something irregular and eerie. All of us dressed in camo overalls and ball caps against the chill. Out on the water, we could hear the sound of the waves change as they began to slap against the aluminum hull of the boat. The boat slid out of the fog toward the bank, its wide, flat prow coming faster than any of us expected. The hump of the judge's body slumped and inert on the bench seat near the rear. Now, Mikey whispered, his voice harsh with effort and fear, and Carl and Sean ran down the half dozen steps to the bank and laid hands on either side of the boat. Chris was right behind him, and he got the first bullet, right in the middle of his forehead. I hit the ground hard enough to knock the wind out of my lungs. My eyes were wide, locked onto that inert mass in the middle of the boat. Now that the boat was closer, I could see that the judge had pulled up, piled up his jacket, an ice chest on the bench to make a vaguely humanoid shape. Carl and Sean let go of the boat like it was red hot, but it didn't matter. Big thunder rolled into two more shots and they fell in the water, little splashes in a big lake. And the concentric circles that their bodies made would fade out of existence long before the waves reached the far shore. Mikey, the big man with the gun, the man with the plan, turned tail and sprinted through the sparse woods surrounding this part of the lake. I could see him dimly from the ground where I dropped at the first sound of gunfire. A few seconds later, I saw the judge, bareheaded and wet, slither out of the water and follow Mikey. He was grinning ear to ear like a goddamn skull. When the judge was out of sight, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the water. I ignored the bodies that floated nearby, prayed they wouldn't bump into me, and hoped that they were dead and not in bad need of help. What the hell could I do for them? 
I grabbed the boat and hoisted myself up and over the side, being as quiet as I could. Blood pounded in my ears, and I couldn't hold down the sobs that racked my chest. Tears streamed down my face as I scrambled to push the pile off the bench and sit. I scanned the shoreline as I dug a paddle into the water and moved away from the bank. If I kept paddling, eventually I'd come to the Alabama side. I didn't even look down at the black nylon backpack at my feet. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bobby. All right. Now we have Donna Thomas. Donna Gossam Thomas is a native of Birmingham, Alabama. She has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. She's been published in PMS Magazine and the Birmingham News. Today, she will be reading an excerpt from her short story, Crossing Paths. This story follows the individual's journeys of three women as each makes a decision whether or not to participate in a Black Lives Matter march. This excerpt is Tiffany Carter's story. Thank you. Crossing paths. Living at 2305 Broad Street was not easy. Every crazy walked this street to get to the entertainment district four blocks away. It was as if the smell of cheeseburgers fried chicken, grilled steak, and pecan-crusted salmon mixed with the tang of vodka, gin, and tequila sent out a hypnotic aroma that floated down Broad Street. Females, short, tall, wide, narrow, most walked the streets with their breasts loose, bopping up and down like brand new yo-yos. There was at least one male to every type of female their eyes contorted, imagining the size of the breast, while their eyes selected which human they wanted to devour. Marijuana scent streamed through the air, sucking in the foul language and the racial slurs. Sometimes it was not the language itself, it was the tone and body movements that made the words so vulgar. Tiffany Carter's kids stood at the window and watched the group of crazies pass by. Drew is 10, Dana is nine. Just the right age for their little sponge brains to suck in all the expletives. Tiffany tried to diffuse the situation. She made the kids watch from the window as opposed to sitting on the steps and getting a fresh scoop, but their unclouded imaginations allowed them to still participate. They made up games like count the number of tattoos or count the number of white athletic shoes. Mostly the game was centered around hair. Count the number of braids, ponytails, afros, pink hair, red hair, orange hair, and sometimes no hair. No hair was only necessary when Dana was losing. There's a bald head, that's mine, Dana shouted. We aren't counting bald heads, Drew replied. Sometimes Tiffany wanted to tell him to shut up and go to his room, not because she was a mean mother, but because she, he just looks so much like his father. Yes, we are counting bald heads, Dana replied. Now she was sassy. She refused to let her brother win at anything. Mom, can we count bald heads? She turned to me with her hands planted firmly on her slim hips and demanded an answer. I'm not in it, you two resolve it. Drew always gave in. After a while, Tiffany pulled the kids away and made them do homework or watch some cute preteen series on the Disney Channel. However, their fascination was with the steady stream of people that walked by the apartment. Their mother, on the other hand, started to regret moving to Broad Street. The relocation from Atlanta to Birmingham was what she thought she needed. She needed to get away from an overbearing mother telling her how to raise her kids. I don't think the kids should go to therapy. They're just too young. Her mom's face was usually soft and perfectly round. Her mouth always spoke words of wisdom. Now that face had hardened and continuous unsolicited advice spilled from her mouth. Mom, Dr. Sheila recommended it. You trust her, don't you? Well, no, mom, I'm not talking about this anymore. 
Her mom always ended the conversation with, you have to get over it, but she never told her how. Her dad, on the other hand, said, only when he was in safe distance from his wife, don't listen to her, she means well. Only you can decide when it's time to move on. Well, one year ago, she decided it was time to move on. Tiffany, Drew, and Dana started to get to a new happy normal. Then coronavirus or COVID-19 shut everything down. She made sure she schooled the children in the proper way to wear a mask. They were to never walk outside the house without a mask securely around their nose and mouth. Picking out the mask had become a continuous lesson in tolerance. Thanks to overjealous grandparents, there were superhero masks, dinosaur masks, sports masks, and masks with wildly colorful designs. Dana usually wanted one to match her outfit. Drew always wanted one specific hero, Black Panther. Tolerance ended the ritual when Dana wanted to wear the Black Panther mask. She could only go two or three days before she nagged her brother. After a few too many ordeals, or ordeals, Tiffany retired the Black Panther mask. There was about 12 weeks of freedom until the crazies couldn't stay shut in any longer. The traffic down Broad Street resurfaced. This time was different. Now on top of COVID, another black man, George Floyd, had been openly murdered by the police. People were going crazy. For Tiffany, it just brought back all the bitterness and anger. Where were these people when her husband died? No one marched for him. No one protested for Donald Carter. No one cared when he was shot by a policeman. Instead, they let the cop continue living his life. He continued going home to his family each evening. His wife didn't have to explain to her kids that their father was not coming home. She didn't have to explain that they would never see their father again. His wife didn't have to explain the reasons for Black Lives Matter. No, his wife didn't have to deal with all the conversations that took place in Tiffany Carter's head. Time will heal all wounds. Who said that? You are young, you will find someone else. I don't want anyone else. He had a gun. Donald Carter did not own or have a gun. Uh, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He jogged in that area at least one day a week. He was dealing drugs out of his gym. That's just a lie. She was sick of it. Tiffany and the kids went to the porch just as a new wave of protesters were passing by. The protesters shouted, Black Lives Matter. There were all races of people moving together. It was like a symphony that had been composed 100 years ago. Now it was finally being played. The children looked at their mother. Mom, can we go? Dana asked. She was almost as tall as her brother. Her dark eyes were more of a plea than a question. Mom, please, Drew asked, grabbing his sister's hand as if they had some type of pleading pack. Daddy would want us to, Dana added. Drew was quick to say, don't say that. You'll make mama sad. She could see the children's hands tighten. In that moment, it was so clear she had created an atmosphere of fear. The children were afraid to speak of their father. She was in an aura of hate. She hated what happened. She hated to talk about it. She hated to share it. She realized she had shut out the two people who would ever come close to understanding her pain. Don't ever be afraid to talk to me about your father, ever. The words were reassuring, but the tone was vexed. Yes, ma'am, the children replied, their hands still intertwined, their eyes desperately searching for the mother they lost when their father died. Do you understand me? Tiffany's tone still felt like a thick mass of Vaseline squeezing through a tiny tube. Drew and Dana responded with head nods and watery eyes. Tiffany pulled them close to her. The children wrapped their arms around her waist and held on to their safe haven, their protector, the one parent they had left. Tiffany absorbed their needs and fears. Her shoulders loosened. She felt the immediate lightness of losing 45 pounds of resentment and hatred. 
She needed her kids to trust her again. She knew it would start with the next group of words that exited her mouth. She asked Drew and Dana, do you know that you are my two favorite people? Yes, ma'am. She pulled them away from her waist. She smiled and said, okay, let's join the crazies. The kids started to move toward the crowd. Hey, hey, you know the rule. She pointed to their eyes and mouth. Mask, Drew and Dana replied as they raced into the house. Tiffany sat on the first step of the porch. She knew it would take a few minutes for the children to decide what mask to wear. She thought of her husband. Was she going to let his death be a statistic? No, it was time to stop hiding herself. It was time to stop hiding her pain. Drew and Dana returned with their mask securely covering their nose and mouth. They placed the black panther mask over Tiffany's nose and mouth. Then Tiffany, Drew and Dana joined hands and walked into the crowd of crazies. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And last but not least, we have Sean De Armand. Sean is a comedy writer who has written several humorous pieces and quite a few more that almost made it. He's a 12 year NaNoWriMo writer, um, mostly because the word count is on the honor system. Today, he's presenting a quick dip into the pool of insanity that all NaNoWriMo participants have to get used to in a dramatic monologue called It Just Is. Any writer who's ever participated in National Novel Writing Month knows the headache of having to turn off your inner critic and just throw a word count down on paper, especially if literally nothing is kicking around in your brain at the time. In those moments, it would be nice if you could summon one of your muses at will, just to get you started so the ideas start flowing naturally. Some of us may even have that ability to summon a muse, but the result seems to look something more like this. What you doing? Need words? How about rhinoceros? Not a real rhinoceros, a metaphor for something else. I like metaphors. I like things. People, I don't like people. People obsess over details. People worry about details. People are details. I like humanity. Humanity is a thing, a concept. A metaphor. Maybe it's not a metaphor, but I like people more than I like humanity. Would it help if I repeated that 10 more times? Would that give it more meaning or less? I think less. It would become a ritual and then an equation. There's nothing deader than an equation. A ritual is almost as dead because its meaning is in the repetition. Thus, a thing means more if it's only done once, which is a strange notion. If the more something is done and the less it means, then does that mean ideas that are never expressed are priceless? For the sake of value, is it possible to stop people from having ideas or merely expressing them? How can you stop an idea from happening? Clutter. Stuff. So much stuff you can't even see the metaphorical rhinoceros. People want stuff. People think about stuff. Unimportant, uninteresting stuff. What a hell with stuff and details. Nothing is what matters. Nothing is beautiful. I love nothing. I need nothing. Someday I'll be nothing and I can't wait. I'm just wasting your time right now. 
I'm giving you words. I'm giving you details. It's what you want, isn't it? Well, it's not what you want per se, but it's what you're asking for. Why? I don't know. Maybe you don't either. But you're asking for words, so I'll give you some. Just know I won't always do that. Nothing personal. Nothing at all. Still, you're here, and I'm here. Now, a little surrealism never hurt anyone who didn't deserve it, so let's just take a moment to be together. Of course, to do that, I have to keep giving you words, and that's not what I want. I give them to you anyway. I'm nice. So, it's you, me, a metaphorical rhinoceros. No, it's gone. And time. It's never enough time. You know, just being is enough for me, but it isn't enough for you. That's the difference between us. I guess I'm a metaphor then. That's fine. I like metaphors and I like me. The two things are compatible. Just don't describe me. That puts details on me and I hate that. I'd stop being a metaphor. Then what's to become of me? Uh, that was a question. Then what's to become of me? Thank you. You don't have to answer, but at least allow me the correct question. Oh, I've got the correct question. What do you see in an empty room? Nothing. Nothing but potential. It could be anything you want it to be. A maze, a prison, a tomb, or a sanctuary. Yes, a sanctuary sentence fragment. Don't edit. Look at the tomb. Look at the empty sanctuary. You don't see a sanctuary. What do you see? I know you see nothing. What did I just say? The room is empty. Look at what isn't in the room. You're not me, the room. What would you put in it? Me? I wouldn't put anything in it. I like an empty room. Except I like being in an empty room. Okay, so I wouldn't put anything in the room but me. Okay, I'm in the empty room now. So stop looking at me. Look at what isn't in the room. That means anything but me. What would you put in an empty room? How about a rug? Yeah, yeah, that would be nice to lay on, to lie on. Stop correcting my sentences and look at the empty room. All right. Forget the rug. What else belongs in the room? Boxes. Empty boxes. I love empty boxes. They have nothing but potential. You can put anything in them. You can crawl in them and they become your sanctuary. You can change the world from inside a box. No, you can't. But you can put the whole world inside a box in a room. All right. So now, what if the room is a box, or better yet, what if the room is a box inside the box? Now you're in the box, you crawl out of the box, you're still in the box, so you keep going and there's another room, another box. Are you trapped forever or are you in the process of perpetual escape? All right. Now, what happens if you go the other way? You start crawling in the box, you keep going deeper and deeper, all right? now. Are you searching for that ever elusive treasure, the heart of all boxes, the center of all rooms? What would be the point? The journey. The journey is what matters. The struggle. You, how do you get there? Do you get there? Why do you get there? If you get there, and of course you get there because you're already there, but the struggle gives it meaning. Without struggle, there's no meaning. That is something. I hate you.
microphone's over here now. All right, thank you. That concludes Flash Fiction <laughs> for 2022. Thank you all for coming out and supporting the arts and uh, have a good rest of your day. All right, and for